When I was in seminary many years ago, I found myself offended by another seminary student. And it really bothered, what he was wearing really bothered me. Um, in fact, I'll go so far as to say that I think this fellow student of mine was in sin before the Lord. We were in Greek class together, and every day in Greek class he'd be wearing the same thing. And so I decided, felt the Lord telling me that I needed to confront him. And this happened a couple of weeks later. We were in a different setting. We were both, at the time, writers for the seminary newspaper, which was called the Jot and Tittle, which uh, Jot and Tittle are different parts of Hebrew letters. And so we're in this, we're in this meeting, and he's there wearing what he wears, <laughs> offending me. And if you're wondering what he was wearing, I'll, I'll tell you, he was wearing flip-flops. <laughs> now, if you're wearing flip-flops today, that's not, not a problem. What, what we wear on our feet is a gray issue, right? We've talked about that. You can wear whatever you want. There's freedom in the Lord. But at that time... In that place, in those circumstances, what he wore bothered me. Why did it bother me? I mean, didn't Jesus wear sandals? I think he did. But yet this was an issue for me. Why did I not just accept him and his preferences? I wore shoes. He wore sandals. If it's gray, it's okay. Well, today we need to begin an important discussion as we continue this sermon series on Christian unity. And this important discussion will inform us that there are times when we need to limit our liberty for the sake of other people. And so when do we find ourselves in situations where there's something that we could do or could say or could wear because of the freedom that we have in Christ, but upon further reflection, we don't say it, we don't wear it. We don't go there. Well, we've been looking at the Roman church and their struggle. Last week, we were in verses 1 through 4, Romans 14, and their struggle was over several issues, but we looked at food preferences last week, and some people were vegetarians and some people ate meat, and this was a big conflict in the church. Well, we're going to continue Paul's teaching today. So turn with me, if you have your Bibles, to Romans chapter 14. We're going to be in verses 15 through 21 this morning. Romans chapter 14, verses 15 through 21. Uh, Paul told us that those who were weak in faith were, were those who did not, meet any, did not eat any meat at all. They had more restrictions than the others. And, and we talked about them being likely Jewish background believers. And the Jewish law said some meat was okay, some meat wasn't okay. They said, the law is such a blessing to us, we're not going to eat any meat. Uh, they were labeled the weak in faith, and then over here were the strong in faith, and these were likely Gentile background believers who ate, as the scripture said, anything that they wanted to eat. Now, when we talk about weak in faith and strong in faith, it's very interesting because Paul's not using that in a negative sense like we would automatically think of it, because what Paul taught us last time is that this group over here and this group over here, they were both fine. If for those who chose to eat only vegetables before the Lord, they were fully accepted. And for those who ate anything they wanted to before the Lord, they were fully accepted. And so their weakness or strongness had to do with their relationship with the liberty available to them. Those who were weak in faith were not living in the liberty that was potentially available to them, whereas those who were in strong in faith were living in more liberty. And, and that's the reference to the strength and the weakness. But Paul's point was very clear all of these brothers and sisters in Christ were fine. The only thing that wasn't fine was their judging and their contempt and their ridicule and their grumbling against one another. And so last week we ended our message with the application to be ambassadors of unity. And as we go through this season of incredible change, the next couple of months, we need ambassadors for unity. That when we start to see grumbling and we start to see gray issues, we're hanging on to them too tightly, that we'll speak into that and that we'll defuse those situations because we hold on to those issues too tightly, our preferences, and we said we have to let it go. If it's gray, it's okay. But that's not the end of Paul's teaching, and so now we're going to add on to that, that at times we will voluntarily restrict our freedom for the sake of someone else. Paul gives us two caveats, if you will, 
to his teaching on gray issues. Two things that limit the liberty that we have in Christ. The first reality that limits our liberty is the law. So the law limits liberty. That's our first point. We have freedom in Christ, but sometimes that which would be otherwise permissible is limited by the law. I'm using the word law generally here, not to refer to the Mosaic law of the Old Testament, uh, but rather I mean our submission to authority over us. That we live in submission to many authorities. It could be that you're using the parks here in Rowlett. You know, they got rules, you know, that they want us to follow, and we should follow those. Uh, traffic laws, you know, we're to live in submission to those. Uh, if you're in the workplace, you have an employee handbook that you probably agreed to abide by the rules of the company. That's what I'm, I'm talking about. The law limits our liberty. Uh, in the case of my flip-flop wearing friend, you may have guessed that at the time it was the seminary's dress code policy to wear shoes. That law limited the liberty of what students could wear on their feet. And so while we were sitting around brainstorming ideas for an article in the seminary newspaper, the student wearing the flip-flop said, let's do a pro and con article on the dress code. Because the dress code was controversial at the time, a great source of discussion among students. He said, I'll write the negative perspective because I disagree with it. I said I would write the positive viewpoint. Now, the seminary has changed their policies since then, and you can wear, I think, anything you want at the seminary now. But at the time, let me read to you the policy that was in place. The policy, or the law, if you will, for students said that appropriate shoes and socks are also a part of this attire, proper student attire. Students are expected, for example, to refrain from wearing blue jeans, short pants, T-shirts, shirts emblazoned with printed messages, caps, athletic shoes, or flip-flops. And so there it was. It was as clear as clear could be. The law was to limit liberty. And so I, I'm not a very confrontive person, but for some reason, this really did bother me. And so I confronted him in that meeting, and I said, did you not agree when you became a student to abide by the student code of conduct, which includes not wearing flip-flops? And he said, yes. And I said, well, given this very clear policy and the fact that you agreed before God to abide by these policies, how is it that you can feel it's okay to wear flip-flops now? And he said, it's a silly policy. It's legalistic. And other seminaries don't have those restrictions. Now, let me set the record straight. I love flip-flops. I've got several pairs at home. I think flip-flops are wonderful. And in Texas in the summer, it's a very common choice of footwear However, if you're a student and you've agreed to a dress code, then that law has limited liberty. And that happens in all areas of our lives. Romans 13, verse 1, the chapter before, Paul says, everyone must submit to governing authorities, for all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. And so my flip-flop wearing friend had confused legalism with obedience. Remember, we have cardinal doctrines that we fight for. We have clear issues which we obey, and then there are gray issues where we accept. What we wear on our feet is normally a gray issue, but if the law has limited that liberty, now it's a clear issue, and I'm to obey the authorities that are in my life. Uh, Jack Apolito was running behind as he drove his 11-year-old daughter to school, and in his rush, he turned right at a red light where that was prohibited. Uh-oh, he said, realizing his mistake. I just made an illegal turn. It's okay, his daughter said. The police car behind us did the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so the law limits our liberty. When our kids were young, we went through a book that had 21 rules. It's called 21 Rules of Our Home, taken from a book by a man named Greg Harris. The book's out of print now, but... It was a great book. I'd recommend it to young families. And I remember a few family nights where we were at Fuddruckers, and we would go over one rule you know, each family night, and there were coloring pages for the kids. And some of the rules included, if we open something, we will close it. If we turn something on, we will turn it off. When someone is happy, we'll rejoice with them. 
When someone is sad, we'll comfort them. When someone is sorry, we'll forgive them. So there are 21 of these beautiful rules that were helpful to bring peace and cohesiveness to our family with uh, four kids. The speedometer on my car goes up to 140 miles an hour. I have a 2004 Honda Civic. I don't think it could get up to 140 miles an hour, <laughs> but how fast a car goes is, is in and of itself morally neutral. But in the great state of Texas, I'm not able to exercise the full liberty of the potential of my car because of what? Speed limits. And so the law can limit our liberty. Tammy and I were on our honeymoon in Germany, and we had at the beginning of our, of our time in Germany rented a Ford Fiesta, very small economical car. They were out of Ford Fiestas, and so instead they rented to us a Mercedes-Benz luxury sedan. I was 23 years old. I'd never driven a car like this, and it was beautiful. Now, in Germany, they have something called the Autobahn. And if you're, familiar, if you're not familiar with the Autobahn, there are no speed limits. And so I was able, as a 23-year-old young man, to drive this Mercedes-Benz luxury sedan 120 miles an hour for an hour. And it's one of the best experiences of my life. <laughs> it was so fun because there the law didn't limit that liberty. But many times it does. Now, before we move to our second point, let me pause and talk about application. What is the relevance of this for us? For us to be unified as we enter into this dynamic season of change, my specific application is to ask you to read our bylaws and relational commitments. To read our church's bylaws and relational commitments. Why? Because these are our two governing documents. These are, if you will, our law. This is how we've decided at this point to govern our church. It's not a bad thing to have laws, to have rules, because laws limit liberty for the sake of unity by providing consistency. And, and so we're able to, be, uh, to live peaceably together. Uh, for example, in our bylaws, we establish our governance as a church, that we're not a pastor-led church, we're an elder-led church. We have congregational input, but we don't have congregational voting. Now, church governance is a gray issue. Uh, churches use all kinds of gov governance models to the glory of God. This is what we've chosen for our church, and so it's in our bylaws. The bylaws talk about the purpose of our elder board, term limits, how someone is appointed. They talk about my role as an elder, but also as an employee of the church. Our bylaws establish our elder board as being gender-specific to men, and our deacon board as being open to both men and women to serve in that office. Now, roles for women in ministry is very divisive in churches, and there are good Christian people that have very different viewpoints on that, but in our bylaws, uh, we have, we have uh, put onto paper what we believe Scripture tells us to do. And so my very practical challenge as we move into this next season of ministry is to familiarize our, yourselves with the law of our land so that we can live together peacefully. If you scan the QR code, we'll leave that up for a little minute, that it'll take you to an online version if you point your phone at it to our bylaws and relational commitments. I was going to have some hard copies, but our internet's been down, so we've not been able to print this week. Um, and, the, and we'll try to have some hard copies next week. But if you're, it's great bedtime reading material, I'll tell you. <laughs> it's not something that we read very often. It's not something I read very often. But there are times where we limit our liberty because we're under a governing authority. And that's a good thing because it provides consistency through which we can have unity with one another. Law limits liberty for the sake of unity by providing consistency. So that's the first thing that can limit our liberty. Otherwise, the freedom that we might have in Christ, we're like, okay, well, I can't express that because of the authority that I'm under. In addition to that, second, we learn from Paul that love limits liberty. Love limits. 
liberty. And here we finally dive into our text. Remember that the controversy is about food preferences. Look at verse 15. Paul says, And if another believer is distressed by what you eat, you are not acting in love if you eat it. Don't let your eating ruin someone else for whom Christ died. Paul's teaching here is profound. Love limits liberty. Our love for one another in the church is a reason to limit the liberty that we would otherwise enjoy because I love you, because I don't want to hurt you, because I don't want to put a stumbling block in your way. For the sake of love, we don't do things. We might not eat things. We might not go to these places. We might not watch this show. We might not drink this drink because of love. Verse 16, Paul says, then you will not be criticized for doing something you believe is good. And so Paul is primarily in this context talking to those who have the freedom to eat whatever they want, which is good for them and accepted by God. And Paul says, you don't want to you don't want to turn something that's good into something that's bad by causing your brother over here or your sister over here to stumble. And, and so if, if you're with a brother and sister in Christ who has a different opinion about a gray issue, well, then you know what? You might just not eat right in front of their face. You might just limit your liberty because of love. Verse 17, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but of living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So Paul reminds us about priorities. Paul says the priority of the church is its unity. The priority is not ultimately the gray issues. That's not the most important thing. Those are fine, but it is, we're not to cause conflict and grumbling in the church because of these lesser things. The kingdom of God is not about what we eat or drink. It makes me think of a, a really helpful teaching that I heard on, on priorities from Tim Sanders, the former chief solution officer at Yahoo. It was interesting. He said there's three types of priorities. He says, and he uses three different materials. He says there are rubber priorities, there are metal priorities, and there are glass priorities. The rubber priorities are the lowest priorities that if you drop them, they bounce right back up to you. It's not a big deal. And so, like, let's say I missed the first Mavericks game of them in the finals. Like, I'd love to see that first game, but let's say something comes up. It's not a big deal. My life is not impacted. It's a low priority. I can take it or leave it. If it's a metal priority, these are things that if you drop them, they'll make a clash and a noise but you can still pick it up intact. And so let's say you're not watching your finances as carefully as you need to in a given month, and the bank tells you you have insufficient funds. And so you're stressed out, and you have to talk to your spouse and maybe transfer some money or sell something. You know, it's, it's, an in, it's, it's a pain, and it's something that shouldn't have happened. You drop the ball, but you work through it, right? You just pick it back up, and the next month you do better. That's a, like a metal priority. But the glass priorities are the highest priorities. If I drop the, these things, they shatter. If I drop these things, they're gone. I may be able to piece them back together, but they'll never be what they were. And so this would be our marriages, our children, friendships. And Paul would say unity in the church. Paul is saying, you've got these food preferences. They're the lowest priority. They're the rubber priority. Yet you are holding so tightly to these that you're letting the unity of the church shatter on the ground. He says, no, 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 that's the wrong priority. We hang tightly to the unity of the church and, and let your preferences, let them go. It's okay. That's what Paul's teaching us this morning, that love limits liberty. Uh, verse 18, if you serve Christ with this attitude, you will please God and others will approve of you too. It's a win-win. God is pleased, others are pleased. You've made a wise decision. Verse 19, so then let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. That's the priority. Verse 20, don't tear apart the work of God over what you eat. Remember, all foods are acceptable, but it is wrong to eat something if it makes another person stumble. Love limits our liberty. 
we can get so caught up in the small stuff that we lose sight of what's really important. Verse 21, it is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else if it might cause another believer to stumble. We might think about a, a, pregnant, a pregnant woman who voluntarily restricts her freedom for the sake of her unborn child. There are things that she won't drink. There are things that she won't eat. There are supplements that she will take. She limits her liberty for the sake of the weaker. The stronger limits their liberty for the sake of the weaker until the weaker can grow in strength. That's the idea. The father of a friend of ours is a pastor, and he was called to a new church in a rural setting. As he got to know the congregation those first few days, he realized that, that they had some legalistic tendencies. And not only were they against watching movies, but they felt it was sin to even step foot in the movie theater in the small town. Well, this pastor had greater liberty than that. This pastor enjoyed watching appropriate movies at the movie theater on date night with his wife. But for the sake of love to his congregation, he chose not to step foot in that movie theater for over two years while he taught his congregation uh, about the freedom that we have in Christ and, and about Bible doctrine and about unity. And he brought them along to the point to where finally this was something that was not going to cause their faith to stumble. Whereas if he would have just said, well, I can do this and I'm going to go to the movie theater and it, it would have blown the church up. And so love limits our liberty. And so this is where we need to talk about application again. What Paul is saying is he's saying, stop in the name of love. Think it over. That's his supreme command to us. When we have a preference, we have freedom in Christ, we're to stop in the name, we're to think it over before you break our unity, stop and think. And so the question would be, where do you enjoy freedom in Christ that might cause another Christian to stumble? That's a good question for each of us to reflect on. In certain areas of our lives, we are the strong in faith. In other areas of our lives, we're the weak in faith. And, and where might we enjoy liberty that could cause another believer to stumble? Maybe you have the freedom to drink moderately and to enjoy a cocktail or a glass of wine, but you're with someone from church who doesn't have that freedom, who, who for them, they have a conviction not to drink. Don't get the margarita. You know, we limit our liberty for the sake of love. It could be that there's a show that you're enjoying on Netflix or Amazon Prime and and maybe the icebreaker question at the Connect group that week is, what shows are you enjoying watching? Well, if you know that that show is probably going to be offensive to some of the people in the room, don't share your liberty if it's going to result in conflict. Don't let the devil use the freedom that you have in Christ to result in something negative. Now, this can be overdone, and we can find ourselves living in fear of causing anyone to stumble, and we could find ourselves living in sort of the paralysis of people-pleasing, and so we don't want to do that, so we just need wisdom from the Lord. We need his wisdom and discernment that as we go through life, for the sake of love or for the sake of the law, we limit our liberty. The English writer G.K. Chesterton said, to have a right to do a thing is not at all the same as to be right in doing it. Let me say that again. To have a right to do a thing is not at all the same as to be right in doing it. Sometimes we can do something, but we shouldn't do something. And that's what Paul has been talking about. Chuck Swindoll has a wonderful book called The Grace Awakening, which, which I would, again, I would recommend to you if you want to dig deeper into this topic of unity and, and um, limiting our unity because of love. Let me just read, sort of as we close, a, a nice quote that he has. He says, Doesn't liberty have its limits? Shouldn't folks restrain their freedom and occasionally hold themselves in check? Yes, without a question. Grace can be and sometimes is abused, 
By that I mean exercising one's liberty without wisdom, having no concern over whether it offends or wounds a young and impressionable believer. But I must hasten to add that I believe such restraint is an individual matter. It's not to be legislated. The best restraint is self-restraint that comes from the inner prompting of the Holy Spirit. Liberty and freedom is freedom in Christ is a wonderful thing bought for us at the cross. But for the sake of love, we limit that liberty. For the sake of the law, we limit that liberty so that we might have unity. So this remember to stop in the name of love and think it over. <laughs> Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you for this lesson on how to live together peaceably by putting the needs of others ahead of our own needs. Bring this truth to bear in each of our lives and in our relationships with one another, in our families, at work, in our neighborhoods, and Lord, please also in our church. Give us the unity that you so deeply desire for us, that you prayed for us to have so that the world would know that your Father sent you.